Portland cement concrete is the most widely used construction material in the world. It is used in bridges, pavements, and buildings. Proper batching and placement are essential to producing long-lasting structures and pavements. The plant inspector plays a key role in ensuring the quality and long-term durability of concrete. The video you are going to view today is titled, A Day in the Life of a PC Plant Inspector. This plant is called a central paving plant. You can recognize this by the drum attached to the plant. However, a lot of the duties and tolerances are the same at a radiomix plant. Your first priority as an inspector should be safety. As you can see, there is a lot happening at a plant. Trucks entering and leaving, loaders going forward and backing to charge bins, and various pickups moving around. Always wear your safety gear and make sure everyone sees you. Always report any unsafe conditions to your supervisor as soon as possible. The first thing an inspector does when he arrives at the plant is to get his moisture samples for the rock and sand. The plant can't start production until the batchman has these numbers to put into his computer. Here the inspector is getting his sand moisture as well as his first gradation for the day. This is acceptable since you get the fine gradation from the stockpile. He is using a probe to sample. You were taught in ag school to pack the sand and then make a vertical face in the pile so you won't get any segregation. Also, this allows him to get deeper where the sand is still moist and not as dry as it would be on the outside of the pile. You can have the loader operator dig into the pile to get a more representative sample. Moistures are not always a real consistent number, so you should try to get these from the area you are batching with at the time. Sometimes the loader operators will use the sand from the trucks dumping that are coming from the sand pit, and this could be wetter or drier material than what is already stockpiled. You should strive to use the most consistent material you can as this will cause many problems for the batch person and the paving operation with inconsistent slumps and errors. Next up is sampling for rock moistures. As you see here, the loader operator has dug into the stockpile two places. This is a must on rock. Rain or hot dry weather can make a big difference in the amount of water on the outside of the pile than on the inside. He will get his gradation sample later as this has to be done from the belt or by taking a stream flow. Now that we have our samples, we can go back to the lab and run our moisture tests. We are going to use the pick jar method. The first thing we always do is to calibrate the pick jar each time we run a test. This is very important because a difference in water temperature from this test and our SPG test can give us a false number. Be sure the water is the same temperature each time. He will then weigh the jar full of water and write this number down. He has weighed out 1,000 grams of sand in a wet condition. We always use this as our sample size for fine and intermediate aggregates. That way, if you forget to write down the sample size, you will remember that it was 1,000 grams. Here he is trying to remove all of the air from inside the jar. As you can see, he twists it back and forth while turning it upside down. Then he fills it up with water, forcing all of the air to the top of the jar. He will then wipe off any excess water on the outside of the jar. This will be what is known as the W1 weight. Now he will do the same thing with the rock, only we use 2,000 grams. Once again, this will become what is known as the W1 number, and he will write this down. We can now take the numbers and enter them into the computer. This is done on our PC plant book program. It will calculate the moistures for us, and will also enter a copy of the test itself. This will be important when your plant book is turned into the RCE for auditing purposes. You are required to run a certain number of these tests. Once you have done this, you now give these to your plant operator and we can now start batching. The plant is now batching concrete and we can turn our attention to our other duties. We still need to get our course gradation. At this plant, they have a portable sampling bin that we'll acquire our sample from using the stream flow method. The bin is charged by the loader two to three times and we will take a minimum of three cuts. 
you will generally need to get a big enough sample for your test and some extra for your monitor's verification test. Back in the lab, we will now split our sample. Here he uses a splitter built into his countertop to break the sample down to the testing weight. He may also use this splitter to get his monitor a sample. The monitor always needs to be with the CPI when they obtain the sample for gradation. After splitting the monitor's gradation, they will take immediate possession of this for their verification test. The CPI will then put his sample in a pan and on the stove to be dried to a constant weight. This lab has a gas stove to dry his samples. Be careful not to turn the heat on extremely high or this can cause the sample to break down. Here he puts his coarse sample in three pans to aid in drying. The CPI will now split his sand sample to test size using the mini stockpile method. This consists of building a mound and then taking four to five scoops from around the pile till we have our required weight. He has enough burners to run both the sand and rock at the same time. Now we can move on to running our speed G's. Our rock sample was run over a number four sieve when we secured our sample from the stockpile the day before. IM307 states that aggregates must be soaked in water for at least 15 hours before running our test. This allows the sand and the rock pores to be completely filled with water. We will start with the rock. Retrieve a big enough sample from the bucket that when you have the stone at SSD, you will have at least 2,000 grams of material. You can help aid the rock in drying faster by rolling the rock in a towel. Be careful not to get too aggressive as this could cause unevenness in drying. As you see here, he is removing some of the large amounts of water on the outside of the rock. Once we are done with the towel, we will put it in a clean, shiny pan. You can use a fan to speed up the time it takes to run your test. Move the rock around the pan and look for dark streaks of moisture on the bottom of the pan. The CPI will weigh up sand for his PG test. Be sure that you have enough material so that in saturated surface dry condition, there will be at least 1,000 grams. Sand will take much longer to dry than rock because of the surface area. Once again, use a clean, shiny pan to put your sample in. You do not use a towel, but you can use a fan to aid in surface drying. We are going to bring the rock and sand to a saturated surface dry condition, or SSD meaning the aggregate particles will not add or subtract water in the concrete mix. This will be one of the more difficult tasks you will run as a plant inspector. It is a judgment call when it reaches this condition and generally just takes time to become proficient at this. We have been telling you to use a shiny pan. This will aid you in determining when a sample is saturated surface dry. As you move the rock around, the pan will show dark streaks from the water on the outside of the rock. When this disappears, you are getting close to SSD. You have several tests going right now, two gradations and two speed Gs. Stay with your speed Gs. These will go from SSD to absorption in a matter of minutes. As you can see, we are getting very close to SSD. When you are satisfied there are no more streaks, the material slides across the pan and in your judgment you have reached saturated surface dry. You need to weigh up 2,000 grams of the rock as soon as possible as this material will keep drying. Be sure to weigh exactly 2,000 grams. It is time to determine our P, S, and W weights for our formula. As I said before, always calibrate your pick jar. 
This will be your letter P. We have 2,000 grams as our S weight. We are now determining our W weight, which is the weight of the material in the SSD condition. Here he is getting all the air bubbles removed. Once he has done this and refilled the jar, he can weigh it. He will write all these numbers down so later he can use the computer to calculate these. Now that he has his rock speed G done and the sand speed G will take some time to dry, he can then turn his attention back to his gradations. He is stirring and checking them for dryness. You can see that he has split his rock into three different pans to speed up this process. He will determine when they are in an oven dried weight, meaning that all the water has been removed from inside the aggregate and are now at a constant weight. They will now be removed from the stove and cooled before they are washed so he can figure the material passing the 200. It is now time to turn our attention back to our sand speed G sample. While our gradation samples are cooling, we will finish determining the P, S, and W weights. This will be done in the same way as our rock, only using 1,000 grams of material. Again, we are using a clean, shiny pan. As the material dries, it will slide across the pan, especially the fines. As you can see, we are not quite there yet, but are getting close. This will change fast, so stay with it and don't let it go into absorption. Keep stirring the material back and forth. Be careful not to have the fan on too high, as this can blow out a lot of the fines. We are just about ready. When all the particles slide easily, and in your judgment it is saturated surface dry, weigh up 1,000 grams as quickly as possible. Be sure when you weigh the material, you use exactly 1,000 grams. Remember, you use 1,000 grams for fine and intermediate aggregate, and 2,000 for coarse aggregate. This way, if you forget to write your sample size down, you will know what they were. Be sure to calibrate the pick jar each time. We are looking for P, our pick jar weight, S, our sample weight, and W, the weight of the material in an SSD state and the pick jar filled with water. The tests for moisture and speed G's are ran the same. Only the speed G is material in a saturated surface dry condition and the moisture test is in a wet condition. The calculations are different, but the computer will do this for you. Here we are just looking for our numbers to write down on a piece of paper. Now the CPI can enter his numbers into the computerized plant book program and determine his actual speed G's. His numbers have to be within .02 of the T203 speed G. We have some time now while our sand and rock are drying and cooling after being washed. It is time to put some information from yesterday's pour in the plant book program. First he will figure up how much total water the plant used the day before. Many paving plants have this information in a summary at the end of the day. He will need this so he can figure his water cement ratio for his plant report. Yesterday's plant report is supposed to be faxed or emailed to the RCE and materials office within four hours of startup today. At a ready mix plant, you will generally have to look at the tickets as these plants can have several jobs going, especially commercial work. There is also a ready mix plant book if you happen to work at this type of plant, and most of the people in this class will be. He will enter all of his material tickets in the plant book. We have to have enough certified materials to do our entire job. Always be sure to check your material tickets for a certified stamp stating that this meets Iowa specifications. You will be audited at the end of the job. A copy of this plant book will become the property of the RCE. Later in class we will be showing you how to fill out the plant book on the computer. Our gradations are washed, dried, and cooled, and they are now ready to be weighed and tested. 
This means that they are testing the aggregate to check for specification compliance and consistency. The monitors, or the RCE's representative gradations, are tested for verification and are used as the acceptance tests. In this class, we will show you in IM527, the paving IM, that you will need to run one gradation a day on the rock, chips, and sand as long as you pave over 500 cubic yards. This also applies to radiomix plants that are paving. 500 yards or more are considered continuous paving. Anything less than 500 yards a day, what we call intermittent paving, can be lumped together as one gradation for the week. If you have questions about the frequencies of gradation testing, be sure to ask your monitor or the PC tech at the materials office. Gradation testing has changed a lot in the last three years and will continue to change. Remember, in this video we are talking paving. Structural testing frequencies are different. We will go over that in class later. After we have the aggregate sieved to completion and weighed, we will write the pan weights on a gradation tablet. Then we can enter it into the PC plant report program on the computer. This will have a tab to figure your gradations and automatically put them on the plant report. The plant inspector will now take a tour of the plant site. First, he will check stockpiles for segregation and contamination. One of the things you have to watch for at the sand stockpile is what we call mud pumping. Sand doesn't make for a good base, so the loader tends to sink and cause ruts on the stockpile floor. If the loader operator doesn't keep his ruts leveled off or runs his bucket too low, he will scoop up this mud and send it through the plant and into the mix. Here the inspector makes sure the loader operator sees him as he walks over to check his rock stockpiles. At the rock pile, we are looking for any foreign material and also segregation. Depending on how the rock is stockpiled, segregation can become a real problem. Sometimes as the rock is being dumped, the coarse aggregate has a tendency to roll to the bottom of the pile. If this happens, it can cause a problem in the mix as well as your gradation. Sometimes you need to watch the loader operator to see that he works his way into the pile and then raises his bucket so as to get a good sample. Also, they should be working the full face of the pile. Be sure to check for any foreign material. Next, he will check the unloading area. Most portable plants used on a paving project are set up in a lot or empty field. Because of this, tracking mud into the plant site can be a problem. That is why the specifications require you have some type of an unloading area. This can be a pit that trucks back up to, or in this case, a bridge that runs over the unloading area. In either case, the pits have to be dug down at least 18 inches and then filled with material that is being dumped. This way, the loader bucket isn't digging into any of the dirt. We have to be very careful after a rain that the trucks don't contaminate the material. The lugs of the tires on the trucks can get filled in with mud. As the trucks go over the bridge, it sprinkles this into the stockpiles. This is unacceptable and will require that they quit hauling material till the ground dries out or they will need to put more rock down leading to the bridge. Make sure there isn't any commingling of the material. Here is an example of mud contamination in the sand. This material was removed and wasted. While we are making our plant inspection tour, we might as well pick up some material tickets. Here he is checking for cement tickets. These tankers are called pigs and they can hold roughly six tanker trucks. Each pig has a mailbox for the truck driver to put his delivery ticket in. This inspector has already gathered the tickets earlier in the day. This is a fly ice tanker backing up to a pig. As we told you at the beginning, keep safety first and foremost. There is a lot of noise and these drivers can't hear you. Always wear your safety vest. 
The inspector is gathering some tickets to be entered into the plant book program at a later time. This paving plant has two mailboxes mounted on posts at the entrance of the plant. This allows the aggregate drivers to stop and drop off their tickets. This way, they aren't in anyone's way and aren't bothering the CPI in his lab. As you just learned in mixed design, rock and sand generally make up two-thirds of a cubic yard. This means there will be a lot of aggregate tickets in a day. You will need to gather these tickets fairly often. Be sure to keep them entered in the plant book in a timely manner. These can stack up rather quickly and you can soon find yourself behind. Portable plants have to be set on some kind of footing so the plant doesn't become twisted causing the scales to bind and not work properly. This footing was poured the entire length of the plant. IM 527 states that before startup the bins have to be loaded for 12 hours and then rechecked by the contractor to see if any settlement has occurred. There cannot be more than one tenth of a foot settlement from one footing to the other. If there is, then the contractor will need to fix the problem before batching. A paving plant has a central drum attached to the plant. Contractors can usually mix 8 to 10 yards of concrete at a time. Mixing time is a minimum of 60 seconds and the maximum time is five minutes. This allows a contractor to produce a large quantity of concrete in a day, as much as 3,500 cubic yards or more. At a paving plant, the drum pours concrete into dump trucks, agitor trucks, or ready mix trucks. Dump trucks need to be unloaded in 30 minutes. If the truck has paddles for stirring the mix, or is a ready mix truck, then it has 90 minutes to be discharged. These are the hoppers and conveyors that feed the overhead bins for the different aggregates. The overhead storage bins sit above the aggregate scales. There are gates attached to the bottom of each storage bin that opens and closes, dumping the different aggregates. The rock, chips, and sand will be weighed on the same scale. In this setup, the rock is weighed first, chips next, then the sand. If you look close, you can see part of the yellow ag scale just below the red holding bins. Cement and flash are stored in different bins and filled by the pigs. The red bin is cement and the yellow bin is fly ash. Aggregate and cement scales have a plus or minus 1% delivery tolerance of what the intended weight is supposed to be. This needs to be checked at least once a day. Here the rock is being weighed first. We have an intended batch weight for the rock of 11,450. The rock gate opens allowing the rock to drop into the scales. When it gets to its target weight, it will close. The scale should read 11,450. However, with a 1% delivery tolerance, or 114 pounds, we need to be in the range of 11,336 to 11,564. In this case, we are in tolerance. After the aggregates, cement, and flash have been weighed, they will be loaded into the drum along with the mixing water. This is a shot of the belt coming from the aggregate scales feeding the back side of the mixer. The cement scale, which also weighs the flash, and the water holding tank are directly above the mixer and also will be discharged into the drum. This is the storage tank for our mixing water. If the water is coming from a potable source, it does not have to be tested. If it is coming from anything other than this, like a pond, lake, river, or even a well that is not a potable source, it needs to be tested by AIM before using to batch concrete. Here are the admixture storage tanks. There will be air and training agent, water reducer, and sometimes retarder. These tanks need to be recirculated first thing in the morning every day you batch concrete. This keeps the solids suspended. As per IM 527, you need to circulate the admixtures a minimum of five minutes for every 100 gallons. This is the plant operator in the control room. His job is to oversee the batching and mixing of the concrete. The plant operator will keep his eye on the computer monitor to make sure that everything is batching properly. 
This includes making sure he is meeting his delivery tolerance of plus or minus 1% for each material being batched. Most computers show this on the screen. It will generally be shown on the tickets also. This is the digital readout that is directly connected to the scales. The top readout is the AG and the bottom the cement scales. When the CPI sees something that needs to be corrected with the plant operation, he's to inform the proper person. The CPI is not to make the adjustment himself. Here is the slump meter. This is just a meter that shows the amps being pulled by the drum motor. If the mix is consistent, the meter will read the same just before it discharges. Here the plant inspector is handing the plant operator his new moistures, which he is required to run one per half day of paving. He will get his water totals for the previous moisture settings for the morning from the batch tickets. One of the duties of the plant inspector is to document the scale sensitivity check done twice a day. Here the aggregate scales is loaded to 28,700 pounds of rock and sand. When the scale has settled and has quit fluctuating, we add a weight that is one-tenth of one percent of 28,700, or 28 pounds, at least enough to move the scale one grad. After we confirm that the scale moves a grad, or 20 pounds, we will then take it off and make sure it returns back to the original full weight. This lets us know if the scales are hanging up and dragging when fully loaded. If the scales are not sensitive and do not move, stop the batching immediately and have someone fix the problem. We will do the same sensitivity check to the cement scales. One of the things a plant inspector and monitor should verify is the mixing time of the drum. As we talked before, the concrete has to be mixed in the drum for a minimum of 60 seconds and not more than 5 minutes after all the materials, rock, sand, cement, fly ash, admixtures, and the water have entered the drum. Determine which material goes in last. In many cases, this is the cement and fly ash. If this is true, then you can watch the computer screen, and when you see the cement scale hit zero, start your stopwatch. You can also stand outside and listen for the vibrator on the cement scales to stop. This means the scale is emptied and the gate will close so it can refill for the next batch. Continue to keep timing until you see the concrete start to come out of the drum. Hit stop and verify you have 60 seconds. During the mixing and before emptying, the batch man may add some trim water to the mix so the slump meter or amp meter reads the same before emptying. This is acceptable. Here are the admixture bottles which measure the ounces of air entraining agent and water reducer that goes into the mix. The batch person will measure up the amounts of air entraining agent that it takes to meet the spec for the percent air of concrete on the grade. This can change during the course of the day. The water reducer has a required number of ounces per 100 pounds of cement found in the appendixes of IM403. Never add the air and training agent and water reducer into the mix at the same time. This afternoon, the plant inspector needs to check the verification of our maturity curve. We will need to make a minimum of three beams. Our CPI will make four instead. This requires testing the concrete for slump and air which you learned in level 1 PC. This will be entered on the computerized verification report. Here they have pulled a truck that has been loaded with concrete going to the grade. Two people are getting the sample while a CPI runs the air test. Once the air test is done, he will then run the slump test. After doing this, we will then make our beams. A verification test needs to be run every 30 days to make sure the mix has not changed any from the beginning of the project. If the verification beams don't pass, then he will have to make a new maturity curve. We have finished making our verification beams, which like the maturity beams are always made at the plant. The inspector is ready to put two probes in one of the beams. We have stripped the insulation from the ends of our thermal coupling wires and twisted them together. These are connected to our maturity meter. We need to insert these into the concrete away from the center of the beams where our brake will be. He used a rod to make the holes three inches in from the side, three inches in from the end, and three inches deep. Once he inserts the wires in the concrete, he will take his fingers to fill in the void around the wires so the air doesn't affect our temperature readings.
We are then ready to protect the beams from drying out by covering these with wet burlap. Next, he will cover them with plastic so the burlap stays moist. He won't remove these until he is ready to strip them. He will finish curing them in wet sand. During the day, the inspector will check his maturity meter for the TTF, or time temperature factor numbers. With verification beams, he will be looking for the TTF number that corresponds with the original maturity TTF number. He will need to wait until these TTF numbers are at or over the original number. Once this has been achieved, he will break all three beams and enter it into the maturity verification computer program. This will calculate the verification TTF number for 500 PSI. If this meets or exceeds 450 PSI, the original maturity curve is considered good. We are now ready to break our beams. All three will be broken at this time. Here he is measuring to the center of the beam where he will make reference marks. Now we put the beam into the breaker. Place the beam as close to the center as possible using your reference marks. We will apply a slight amount of pressure with the long handle and then remove the pins. He will apply roughly one half of the anticipated break with the long pump handle. Then he will finish breaking the beams with the micro handle at the rate of 1200 pounds per minute. This needs to be done slowly as turning the handle too fast could cause us to get a higher reading. Once the beam breaks, we will remove the broken halves and check our reference mark for the required inch and a half. Then we will measure our width and depth of the beam as tested. These will then be entered into the computer program. As you can see, the plant inspector has many duties. Each day there will be different tasks to perform. The hard work of the plant inspector pays off in the finished product shown here.